thank you all for coming tonight to Carnival in Philly, a closing party for um, Philadelphia and New Perspectives, an art show hosted by Taya Puerto Riqueño, our, our, uh, our gracious host for the evening as well here uh, in the theater. I want to first of all uh, introduce myself. I'm Greg Scruggs, uh, also known as DJ Gregzino. We'll be hearing some of that a little bit later. And together with my partner in crime, Juan Bustamante, aka Wonderful, we are Tropicalismo, a crew that has been promoting Afro Latin Caribbean music and cultural events in Philadelphia for the last five years. Uh, Juan is also a visual artist whose work you can see here tonight and in the, the Philadelphia show uh, next door, which is open for another week. Uh, so please check it out uh, when, when you get a chance at the, at the gallery in the main tire building, just up the block on North 5th. And we're also going to have the uh, slideshow of the artwork playing throughout the evening uh, after the salon, so you'll be able to get a little taste of it. And many of the artists here tonight are in the room. Can you raise your hand if you are in the show, uh, the, the Philadelphia show? Let's get it all past the incredible work going on showcasing uh, new work by young Latino artists here in Philadelphia. Uh, and so we also want to thank Tayer, uh, specifically curator Rafael Damas, who put together the show and invited us to, to put this on this evening, as well as... work as I have learned in the last couple of weeks, putting, putting this together as a, as a novice. Uh, as well as uh, Tayer's director, uh, Carmen Fibo San Miguel, and the chairman of Taller is here tonight as well, chairman of the board, Edgardo Gonzalez, so please thank both of them. <laughs> We've also got many wonderful volunteers, especially uh, Kat Hillman from Taller, who's been really instrumental in getting this together, and uh, we couldn't come to, could not have come together without everyone's support. Uh, so, uh, we're here tonight, though, to talk about Carnaval in Philly. Uh, maybe not the first city that comes to mind when you think of uh, hot spots around the world for the, the traditional celebration that happens before Lent in, in February or March. Uh, but Philadelphia, actually, as a, a growing multicultural city, is home to several distinct carnival traditions that I've had the pleasure and excitement of interacting with, researching with over the years uh, as a, a writer, a DJ, and a scholar who's focused on carnival for his uh, academic studies, actually. And I'm, I'm here then to share four uh, examples from our community of this global phenomenon of carnival, uh, Come Home to Roost in Philadelphia. We're going to be hearing about the Mummers Parade, which uh, is a very much a native Philadelphia tradition, uh, although uh, not necessarily tied to the, the Lent calendar uh, the, with that same heritage as, as carnival, uh, you know, Fat Tuesday and the like. Uh, nevertheless, is very much a carnival-like celebration with a parade down Broad Street. We're going to hear more about that from Jesse Engard, the captain of the uh, Rabble Rousers New Year's Brigade. Uh, we'll also be hearing from, uh, from Alex Shaw, the band leader and director of Alo Brasil, one of the, the top Brazilian music ensembles on the East Coast, and certainly will be the leading one here in Philly, uh, who's been putting on carnival shows for over 10 years now. And Unfortunately, our guest from the Caribbean uh, American Heritage Foundation of Pennsylvania could not make it this evening, so I'm actually going to be substituting for her and sharing a little bit about the background of um, Philly Carnival that's led by the Caribbean community. And finally, we have Edgar Ramirez from San Mateo Carnavalero, which is the organization that puts on Carnaval de Puebla. Uh, it's the largest uh, Puebla, as in uh, the state of Mexico, Puebla-style carnival in the United States, happens right here in South Philly, going into their ninth year, and uh, he'll be joined by this year's president of the Carnival de Pueblo Committee, uh, Davi, as well. Um, so to kick it off, we're, we're going to keep it local, keep it Philly, and start with the, uh, the mother's tradition. So Jesse is going to share uh, some of his experience after we get a little bit of the sights and sounds of New Year's Day 2015 on Broad Street, right uh, here in Philadelphia. So please direct your attention to the screen. Thank you. 
So I worked for the first time in 2008 with a first-time brigade called the Vaude Villains in the Mummers Parade. And I started my own group called the Rabble Rousers in 2010. The Rabble Rousers and the Vaude Villains were kind of an experiment to see if the idea of Mummers could be recreated from scratch. Um, it turned out pretty well. Um, we were accepted into the parade um, and um, surprisingly just very welcomed into the parade. And won first place in the 2013 Woo! in the in the um, comic, in the comic division and, um, and uh, I don't know I, I was quite I was pretty surprised because I kind of started out with, with the idea that a lot of people have which is that you kind of you have to your dad has to be a mummer in order for you to be a mummer and that's just not exactly it's not it's totally not true um, in fact like anyone's really welcome to join who wants to uh, who wants to march in the group. So that was that was great. Um, I'm gonna I'm going to start tonight by uh, giving you uh, a story, my story of the origins of mummers uh, as a tradition that thrived because of inclusion and has been suffocated by a lack of inclusion. Uh, first, I'd like to talk about uh, the way that carnival and mummers are similar to me. Um, I love these traditions because they seem even older than the history that is told. Um, who was the first person to put on a costume and dance around in public? We know it wasn't uh, Christians that invented the idea behind Carnival, and we know it wasn't Philadelphians who invented the idea behind New Year's, or it, 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 just, it comes, it's something that reaches back past what anyone can remember, and I, I love that about it. And um, I, I see that as a similarity between this, because for me it's part of my nature to go out in, in the public and do this, and, um, and I've seen um, that it's also a part, a lot, a part of what, uh, you know, a part of what other people are about to. Um, I'm so glad to be here tonight. Yeah. Uh, um, so we can start. Please enjoy this slideshow of Mummer's history, as brief as it may be. Okay. So, um, the, so the, you know, what's commonly thought of and where the name 
most likely comes from it's from the British Monarch plays, which um, uh, was commonly celebrated around Christmas, but were ended up being pushed away from Christmas because no one wanted to have Mummers be a part of Christmas. <laughs> so they're like, oh, why don't you go do that that New Year's thing? And then you anyway, know, slowly creeped, and then became like part of part of New Year's. Um, and the, the Swedish also re reportedly made loud noises during New Year's. Um, and the, but the British Mummer plays often. Oh, wait, did we go past the quack doctor? Sorry, that was part of the British Mummer play. There's no quack doctor. I must so the Germans brought uh, their carnival uh, with them. <coughs> they were celebrating uh, carnival before Lent. Um, and, um, and what ended up happening, as far as I've read, is that the Germans kind of like ended up merging their traditions with Mummers because they fit together and it was more acceptable. Which I, uh, that's just part of that. And then the Irish came and um, brought some of their mummers to visit um, with their masks and things. And um, um, okay. yeah. And so what we have is, is different different people in Philadelphia taking cues from each other and building on all the different themes that in, in one another's. Um, Costumes and what ideas of what what a public performance should should look like and sound like, and um, so yeah, we have Eastern European people bringing their, their costumes, uh, the kukeri is, is what they're called um, in some countries. Um, yeah, the next one, uh, I love these costumes. They they really show the. Um, the origins of uh, back pieces, you know, kind of, I think uh, we can say that like the Polish and Bulgarians and Hungarians brought with them these traditions of these huge back pieces, which was, I think, something that uh, people took cues from and, and it became this, uh, you know, a staple in the Mummers Brigade, Mummers Brigades. Um, uh, Af Africa, not shown here, um, African Americans had a huge part in creating music and dancing that makes more of what it is today, even though there's uh, like little, there's not very much representation from African American communities today. Um, which brings up my uh, my next point, which is, should I talk more into this microphone? Yeah. Okay. All right, sorry. Um, my, my point um, to the mummers when I talk to them at our meetings and things is like, when did we stop inviting new immigrants to the Mummers Parade, and why do former immigrant communities fall, fail to see the irony of their, their xenophobia? Um, there's general lack of active outreach coming from existing Mummers, the lack of transparency from the city, and not many arts organizations really organizing around the parade. Um, but there's there's definitely hope, and I've, I've been seeing like um, some great emergence, and uh, this this um, this uh, event being one of those things, but I guess, uh, oh yeah, okay. Um, so this is someone noticing the fact that, um, you know, the same thing, I, I'm not the only one noticing this. Um, Al Aldea is, is saying that wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if, if these people were in, in the parade, and now I'm sitting at a table with them, so. Um, I'm very, very happy to see all this happening, and, uh, um, yeah, I want to personally invite you to be in the Mummers if you, if you would like to at all, and, um, I'll do everything I can. I would do everything in my power to make that happen, and, uh, and I think you'd be welcome with, with uh, wide arms. Um, I really see, I really hope to, hope that, um, okay, I guess next slide. There, there have been groups who recently have stepped into the parade and represented, oh, sorry. Um, okay, 
it, these are different ways that people can become parts of the comic um, division. Okay, um, we've got individuals, juveniles, couples, groups, brigades. You can really do anything and be a part of the Mama's Bridge. Um, the Chinese New Year uh, brigades have have stepped into the parade and, and been part of it. Um, and I really hope what we are seeing is an opening for a new definition for what Mummers is, year-round, really. And um, Mummers meaning, you know, Philadelphia parade tradition, I guess, broadly. Like, we need to broaden the, the idea of what Mummers really is. Um, you know, I, I would prefer to see it as a tradition of inclusion, like I said, and a tradition that no longer needs specific history to justify itself. I think I just think the instinct to be out there on the streets strutting and embodying the state of transcendent merrymaking is enough to form a tradition around it. And um, I guess that's it. And that's it. Is that it? Oh, one last slide of, uh, of Trinidad. Um, thanks for having me. And if anyone wants to, to take the mummers by storm with me and shake things up a little bit, uh, don't hesitate. <laughs> Don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I can get I can get you in the parade this year, um, and whatever we want to bring to this, you are welcome. And I can't wait to uh, find out more about Carnival and the different traditions that are happening around the world. Thank you so much for us. Cool. Next up, we're gonna have. Alex Shaw from Mission is the musical director and band leader of Alo Brasil, uh, who, if you have not seen perform live, you uh, have, are, your, your Philadelphia nightlife credentials are severely lacking, if that's the case. We're going to give you a little taste of that. We're going to play a clip from their carnival show this year. It was at World Cafe Live, which they do every year. So start planning ahead. And yeah, we'll, we'll let that run, Rafael, and then, and then Alex will talk. Good evening, everybody. Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Okay, um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here this evening um, representing Alo Brasil. Um, and I guess what I wanted to speak about, since the carnival tradition um, in Brazil is so vast, you know, I wanted to speak more specifically about my group's orientation and kind of uh, role in the, in, the, in the cultural scene here in Philadelphia. Um, we're certainly not the only group, obviously, that, that um, represents carnival here, but we started, the, the, the ensemble is called Alo Brasil, we're about 11 musicians plus dancers and plus special guests um, for the carnival show. We started the group about 15 or 16 years ago and I think it was 2004, we finally decided, you know what, we need to be doing a carnival show annually and we, our first one was at the Tropicana Theater 
and I think tickets were like eight dollars, and there like, was a line around the block, and they they had no idea what to expect. They had never sold so many walk-up tickets. They had to shut the doors because it was a security hazard. And we walked out. We had cut a sweet deal with the club. They had no idea. They, they basically they didn't they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't have no security, you know. So we at the end of the night we walked out, you know, and they they, they felt like we had robbed them <laughs> because we had just. They had no idea that to, what to anticipate, but that set off uh, a wonderful um, tradition that uh, after that first year at the Trocadero Theater, we started to um, to play at the World Cafe Lot. And as you can see, these are just some shots. These are some images from both 2013 and 2015 to kind of get a sense of, of the, the, the vibrancy and the energy of the evening. Um, so, so the Brazilian carnival here in Philadelphia is interesting. Brazilian tradition, musical traditions have been, um, I would say, alive and well and, and have been going on since um, the late 70s and the 80s, really. Um, starting with groups like uh, Phila Samba and, and, uh, and, and other groups now that have, have, have been created. What I think my role is in terms of um, Alo Brasil is we do play throughout the year. We play at different festivals, we play at different venues, uh, we play all over the, all over the place. But when it comes time for Carnival, um, what we wanted to do, or at least in terms of my vision, is to bring a, a certain community together. Um, it's interesting that our tradition um, of Carnival, the band is based in Philadelphia, but the musicians are actually now Brazilian, including myself. I'm American, but I've been going to Brazil for many years, and it's been part of my own experience to, um, of going to Carnival in Brazil and also just studying for many, many years and wanting to bring that element of Brazil. I've seen Brazilian culture and Brazilian music explode exponentially over the, you know, the last 20 or so years that I've been in Philadelphia. And it's, I've, I'd like to think that Alo Brazil has a lot to do with people. Uh, first exposure, I've had so many people come up to me and say, you know, I met my husband or my wife at your show. I've been to Brazil because I went to your show. Like, it's amazing the kind of transformative experiences that I think we've, we've been able to have in the Philadelphia community. And, um, you know, so what you're seeing, some of the images that you're seeing here are special guests. For Carnival, for me, it's, it's almost like a curation uh, opportunity for curating because I don't just want to showcase the band and what we do, but also have opportunities to bring other members of the community in, right? Because we're, we're based in Philadelphia, and so I wanted to bring elements of Philadelphia in. What you're seeing, some of these young folks here are actually drummers from Harlem. There's, a, there's a, a, a samba group up at one of the schools in Harlem, and I had a chance to meet and work with some of those students um, earlier, and I had invited them to come down and participate in Carnival. And so what you're seeing here is some of the after carnival, after show and out in the lobby, out in the foyer, where the party keeps going and keeps, keeps happening. So those are some images from, from 2013, and uh, now you're seeing some images from 2015. Um, the video that you guys saw, um, I had invited certain um, guests from the Afro, from the African, from the West African dance community to participate, um, and you saw the Chicago still walking or the dancer also participating. So um, it's interesting that the kind of positioning of Alo Brazil, because a lot of us I look at us as sort of a bridge between um, different cultures. I see us as a way to um, to bridge Brazil to the Philadelphia community. Um, and, and the way that we even choose the material, like I think it's interesting, There's, there is a Brazilian community here in Philadelphia. It's actually become smaller over the years, but in the Northeast there's still quite a sizable uh, Brazilian community. And we have had opportunities to perform in that community. Um, about 10 years ago they tried to do a summer festival, and we were part of that summer festival. They brought Olodum and some other groups from Brazil to participate in that. Um, but it was always an interesting kind of culture clash because Brazil, as you know, is a big country. And there's lots of different, um, lots of different regionalisms, and so a lot of the, the Brazilian community based here in Philadelphia are actually from Minas and from Goiás, and so the kind of carnival traditions that you might think of, the Haley from Rio, from Salvador, from, from Recife, those those are in some ways kind of foreign to even the, the Brazilians that come from more of the central region of Brazil. So. Um, there's different musical tastes and different musical orientation, and we've never quite been able to, you know, to integrate very well into the Brazilian community in Philadelphia. It's interesting, and the Brazilians also don't tend to come to the city and do sort of downtown things. They kind of hang out in the, in the community and, you know, party in different, in different ways. So, um, I guess the point 
that I wanted to make that was really important for me was the idea of bringing community together, um, bringing the Philadelphia community. This year, we actually had an opportunity to invite some mummers, ironically, uh, for the very first time. We wanted to have a mummer element, and so we brought in a few guests from the Golden Crown Fancy Brigade. Um, you might see a couple pictures at some point in the slideshow, perhaps towards the end. Um, and so what you see here is also audience participation coming up on stage. We like to break down the walls of, of uh, the audience versus the, the performers and have op opportunities for audience members to come up and to participate with us on, up on, sta on stage. Right here is interesting because these are actually youth from Camden. Um, there's, an, uh, there's some of the members, yes, yeah, you can see representing. So some of the youth from Camden, we've been working with um, some of our colleagues who teach in Camden. Uh, and have an ensemble called the UCC Royal Brass Band that actually specialize in New Orleans style second line music. So this idea of trying to draw these lines between, you know, the mummer tradition here in Philadelphia, draw to the New Orleans kind of jazz and second line carnival tradition, the Mardi Gras tradition, and wanted to put it together and finding ways in which we can collaborate and integrate these different traditions. And this is what you see is some of the be most beautiful music um, and, and energy really spirals out of this opportunity to work together. I believe this is the, sort of the culmination of our, of our slideshow. Um, and then I could talk on for, for a while, but I think my, most of my points have been hit. All right, but thank you so much for having me. Thank, thank you, Alex. And maybe, maybe uh, we can also bridge and have some uh, San Mateo Carnavalero at Carnival next year at World Cafe Live as well. You guys are going to have a busy, a busy calendar next year. <laughs> uh, so, as I mentioned, I'm going to be a pinch hitting for uh, Sheila Buchanan from the Caribbean American Heritage Foundation of Pennsylvania. Uh, she and her organization have been involved with several Caribbean cultural events here in the city, uh, specifically Philly Carnival. Uh, we're going to watch a short clip from the 2013 Philly Carnival, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how Caribbean Carnival fits into uh, the whole milieu that we're discussing tonight. See where that's going. Um, so that that was uh, from Fairmount Park in June of 2013. Uh, they will be returning to the park in June of this year as well. Uh, Father's Day weekend, I believe, is the date. Uh, you can look it up on Facebook online. Uh, Philly Carnival, and uh, the the carnival tradition. You know, Brazil gets maybe the the lion's share of the attention. Uh, the Caribbean is very close behind, especially Trinidad and Tobago, which. Uh, claims to be the land of carnival with their their steel drum tradition, um, their masquerading, their costuming, calypso, uh, and you know they have been a, a huge. Uh, I've been before a huge extravaganza at the traditional carnival season in, in February and March. And uh, if if the Brazilian community is one that's maybe struggled to to really gain a, a foothold in a city like Philadelphia, the Caribbean community is that is quite robust. Uh, we have predominantly in Philadelphia uh, Jamaican. Haitian, Barbadian, and Trinidadians, and specifically in West, Southwest, and parts of North Philly, uh, especially around Germantown. And it's not the um, it's not the largest Caribbean community in the in the U.S. That would probably be that would almost actually definitely 100% be in New York City, especially Brooklyn, where they've had a long-standing 
carnival that started in Harlem over 100 years ago and moved to, to Brooklyn sometime in the last 30 odd years. Uh, and because of the, uh, the weather, as you can imagine, being dressed like that would not be so much fun in Philly in February, especially this year. Uh, the, the Caribbean community has basically created their own calendar in the diaspora, in, uh, in their, their you know, cities that they've settled in outside of the region, and moved it to the warmer months to, to be able to sort of celebrate outside and in the street, something that uh, San Mateo Carnavalero has also done. We'll hear some more about that shortly. Uh, and in, in the case of the Caribbean carnival traditions, um, there, you know, there's been a, a history, really, of using carnival as a way of sharing a positive side of a, of a community that's maybe been discriminated against uh, because of their race, because of their national background. Uh, not so much in the Philly case, but the, perhaps the most famous instance of this is in London, a city that's home to a very, very large Caribbean community, uh, especially because many of the English-speaking Caribbean countries previously were British colonies. And mass immigration from the Caribbean to London in the 1950s actually resulted in race riots where uh, white working class Londoners were not comfortable with their new neighbors and it led to some, some ugly clashes. And out of that was born the Notting Hill Carnival, uh, which is now the largest street festival in all of Europe. And it began as a way for the Caribbean community to rally together to present a kind of a unified front, um, not just as Jamaicans or Trinidadians or Barbadians, but as, as Caribbeans or West Indians. And it's uh, as also as a way of, of you know saying we're we're not you know uh, bad people we're not loafers we're not you know taking your jobs whatever we we have a culture that we're proud of and you know part of pushing London to become the, the multicultural uh, city that it is today um, so that's the kind of thing that's happening here in Philadelphia as well uh, insofar as that community wants to um, get out of the shadow a little bit of the African American community. Uh, which is, of course, a very significant part of contemporary Philadelphia and its heritage. And it's not to uh, sort of say that they don't want to be a part of that, but to recognize that as an African diaspora community, um, you know, Caribbean traditions are related to, but also different from some of the more the, the African-American traditions, and for that matter, some of the West African traditions, as that community has reached a, a, a larger and larger presence here in Philadelphia. So the... Um, the, the Caribbean Carnival has also been coupled with some other key events on the calendar. For 18 years now, there's been a Caribbean Heritage uh, Festival Day at uh, Penn's Landing. And uh, I was speaking earlier today with, with some of the folks from the, the, that organizing committee that, you know, they, they were stress, stressing to me, to stress to you, um, that uh, arts and culture and food for, for the Caribbean are, you know, one of their, I mean, it is their, their strong suit. As a, as a culture, uh, you know, the festival traditions, music, carnival, and sharing that is a way of, uh, of getting on kind of the radar in, in a city like Philadelphia, as you know, maybe you can be anonymous um, when you know, you're in your workplace or on the SEPTA or what have you, but that, um, and especially in the context of, of, of race relations in the US, where you know, we sort of think of things as black and white and don't necessarily recognize on either side of that spectrum, that there are, you know, white folks with lots of different ethnic and national backgrounds, and black folks with lots of different ethnic and national backgrounds, and in this particular case, the Caribbean community uh, sees these opportunities, the carnival and the Heritage Day at Penn's Landing, to really um, embrace where where they're from, and you know, it, it may not be a region that's that's deeply understood by mainstream Philadelphia or mainstream American society. But when you're out there on the streets, loud and proud, and you know, waving your flags, or, or as one of the very popular carnival tunes from two years ago goes, um, to pump your flag, and you'll see folks you know, with their flags in their hand, on bandanas, on sound trucks, on their costumes. Um, it's a chance for a very healthy kind of national pride to come out, as, um, as you know, the, the, the diversity of the Caribbean uh, is on display at the same time as it's a, a unified tradition and a unified culture. Um, so I would encourage everybody to check out uh, the plans for Philly Carnival 2015. It's going to be Father's Day weekend in Fairmount Park. You can look them up on Facebook under Philly Carnival. And also keep an eye on the Penn's Landing calendar for, uh, you know, they have a whole host of, of multicultural events all throughout the summer. And to keep an eye out for the Caribbean Heritage Day, which I believe usually falls in August. Uh, so thank you for uh, for 
uh, letting me you know, pitch in and, and share a little bit about a culture that I'm quite passionate about, having spent Carnival in Trinidad, and you know, we've worked one and on the Calismo. I've actually worked with the steel drum band that was in the video, the Philadelphia Pant Stars, that are based out of Southwest Philly. Um, and for uh, all things Caribbean culture in Philly, I also strongly recommend Brown Sugar Bakery on 52nd Street in West Philly. Uh, that's a place where Juan and I got our first taste, literal and figurative, of the uh, all the cultural activity, food, music, uh, carnival, and otherwise going on. It's kind of incredible how many events every weekend, uh, parties, boat rides, other activities that community is putting on with uh, top-notch DJs, MCs coming in from Jamaica, from Trinidad, from New York, and the like. Uh, and you'll be hearing some more of that music later because that, that's one of my favorites uh, to share when it comes to carnival tunes. So thanks again, and we're now going to move on to our last uh, speaker of the evening, Edgar Ramirez from San Mateo Carnavalero, which is the organizing committee for the Carnaval de Puebla. He's also the host of Phil Latino Radio, a community radio station based in South Philly. At, uh, is it phillatinosradio.com? So if you want to listen in to the latest uh, community news from the, the Latino and Mexican community out of Philly, I encourage you to check out uh, phillatinosradio.com, where he, uh, he's often on the mic and was gracious enough to have Juan and I in for a little session to, uh, to promote this event. And he's also joined by David Pina, who is the president, the, yeah, it's a rotating uh, system, the president this year of the 2015 Carnaval de Puebla that will be happening in April. And he'll be, so the two of them will be sharing a little more about that. And uh, could we have our, our translator joining us as well on stage, or, or at the podium rather? Buenas noches. Bueno, buenas noches. Gracias a Tropicalismo y a Carlos Pequeño por invitarnos a San Mateo Carnavalero a hablar de nuestro carnaval. David Piña, que es el presidente, me acompaña. Voy a tratar de, de, de explicar un poquito esto, son mil años de historia, entonces a ver si en diez minutos me puede... Oh, sí, para que nos entiendan mejor. So, uh, but before he gets into the history of the Carnaval de Puebla, we also have a clip that shows both the Carnaval in México and uh, here in Philly.
Pues ahí está el presidente también del carnaval. El asunto de, del carnaval de Puebla es ser carnavalero no solamente eh, en abril, sino es todo el año. So the deal with being a carnavalero is to be in a carnavalero is, year round, not just in April. Es una, es una forma de vida. Eh, México tiene muchos carnavales. So the Carnaval de Huevo Chingo um, is one of the oh, uh, is one of the primary, the main uh, carnavales. El Carnaval más antiguo de, de, de este género tiene 400 años. So this is about 400 years old, a 400 year old tradition. Pero el carnaval de Huacotzingo eh, se viene haciendo ininterrumpidamente desde 1869. So the specific carnaval from Huacotzingo is from 1969. So from 1879. Hace 147 años. Eh, ¿Qué y, y aquí en Filadelfia este carnaval lo venimos realizando por los últimos nueve años. So this carnival has taken place over the last nine years. Bueno, es es como les decía al principio, ser carnavalero es una forma de vivir, representa muchas cosas. En realidad, esto es la verdadera historia del 5 de mayo. En el video que vimos, estuvimos haciendo énfasis en los cinco principales actores de de este carnaval. Eh, el traje que tiene David es el principal, que es los zapadores. Esta parte es una mezcla de mexicanos y extranjeros. Es una mezcla de, la, de, de todas las culturas. Oh, y también esa fue eh, la asimilación que hubo de, de esta mezcla de culturas cuando la intervención francesa. Era el soldado eh, eh, real, real de, 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 de Puebla, podríamos decir. Es un soldado. Es un soldado. Todos son, todo, todo es un, todos son soldados. Hay, hay cinco batallones. Otro de los más de los principales también es Indio Serrano, los suavos, los franceses, los turcos y los acapuastlas. Es complicado de tener porque decía que es una mezcla de, de México y, y de la. Y de, ahí tenemos esta, esta parte. So these are the five different types of battalions. There's the first battalion, the second battalion. So, eh, es eh, Zacapuatlas, es una región en, en Puebla. Turcos. Suavos. Eh, eh, en, la parte, en la parte mexicana están eh, los indios serranos y de la otra parte es el ejército eh, francés, que era la legión extranjera. <risa> es una clase de historia. <risa> So the, the, the other battalion is the, the French occupying force. Y bueno, después de tantos años, 147 años de realizar esta actividad, es algo que se lleva dentro de todos los poblanos y también de los mexicanos, por supuesto. En Filadelfia solamente estamos representando los cinco los cinco personajes que estamos hablando, porque como vieron en el video, es mucho es mucho más grande. So Carnaval de Puebla is something that's become basically the cultural heritage of all Mexicans. Here in Philly, they, they just limit it to these five battalions uh, because as you can see from the video, in, in Puebla it's actually much bigger with many more different varieties of characters. Eh, el sueño de nosotros los carnavaleros es tener los caballos, tener la pólvora, pero a lo mejor no va a ser posible, ¿verdad? Pero, pero eso es lo que, lo que sentimos a la hora de hacer, del, hacer el carnaval. Le digo que se lleva, es una pasión, 
es, es una forma de vivir, es una mezcla de conocimientos y de cultura. So, as you can see from the video in, in Pueblo, they have horses, they have uh, actual gunshots, which you can't get away with in Philly uh, legally, sadly, thankfully, uh, editorializing here. But as he says, it's, it's, um, it's a passion, it's a way of life, and it's a, it's a, a knowledge of mixing cultures. Eh, este carnaval, eh, el carnaval de, eh, que, que ustedes están viendo es patrimonio de, de, de la UNESCO, es patrimonio cultural de la UNESCO de este 1900, de este, de este 2010, perdón. Y nosotros queremos eh, conservarlo tal y como se hace en Puebla. So the, since 2010, the Carnaval de Puebla has actually been a registered uh, world heritage uh, by UNESCO, the UN body that certifies uh, you know, cultural traditions. Uh, which is a very, just, this is me editorializing again, it's a very special distinction that only, I think, two other, two or three other carnival traditions in the world have. Um, so it's, UNESCO considers it a masterpiece of world heritage, of oral and tangible world heritage. Uh, and, and Edgar was explaining that they brought it to Philly um, in an effort to kind of preserve it for the local community. Y bueno, pues finalmente este, este carnaval en Filadelfia es el más grande de la región. Eh, vienen eh, personas de muchos, eh, de muchos estados de los Estados Unidos, incluyendo eh, California y, 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 Chica y la ciudad de Chicago, pero también está viniendo ya gente de México a participar en este carnaval. So this is the largest Puebla style carnival in the United States, and poblanos come from all over the country. Locally, you know, New York, New Jersey, Chicago, California, and actually are starting to come from Mexico for the Carnival here in Philly. Entonces, realmente eh, queremos que, que todos conozcan parte de nuestra cultura. Esto es prácticamente el verdadero 5 de mayo. Este, y eso es lo que significa esa mezcla de culturas eh, que vino a establecerse en Puebla y que hoy en día es la mayoría de la gente que vivió a esta parte de Filadelfia. So, he... he really wants everybody to get a chance to experience this, this true mixing of cultures. Um, and the reason that the, the Mexican community here in Philadelphia is composed primarily of poblanos, which is why this particular carnival uh, has caught on here in Philly. Uh, David, que es nuestro presidente, no sé si quiere agregar algo, pero este traje tan bonito es hecho por artesanos eh, de Huecotzingo. Todo es hecho a mano. So this is a handmade costume by artisans from uh, what, see the, the, for me, the hard part is pronouncing the. What, what, ¿Cómo se llama la? la what the uh, from Wahoo Jingle, uh, and so David, I think, is going to join us and share a few words as the the president of San Mateo Carnavalero this year. ¿Tú vas a hablar un poco? ¿Qué tal? Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es David Piña, soy este, el presidente de San Mateo Carnavalero para este año. Este, bueno, primera, bueno, por primero quiero invitar a, a todos si gustan ustedes de, de ser parte de este evento, que es el día 26 de abril. Son ustedes bienvenidos. His name is, is David Piña, he's the president this year of San Mateo Carnavalero, and he wants to invite everybody to come to the carnival on April 20, 25? 26, on, a, on April 26th. Where? It's a third in Washington. El 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 es que inicia a las tres en Washington. No sé. Okay, so at, at noon, uh, from from the from Ninth Street to the calle nueve con Washington. Oh, okay, Ninth and Moyamensing at noon on April twenty sixth, uh, and then it ends. It, it termina a las tres en Washington. And it ends at, there's a large uh, park at 3rd and Washington, which is where you could see the, um, the, the last part of the video, the, everybody dancing in the field. Um, just, I'll warn you, the dust kicks up pretty heavy, so you know, be prepared. You need a mask like, uh, like these guys. Bueno, pues, este carnaval realmente nosotros este lo, lo comenzamos hace nueve años, que fue prácticamente pura familia, familia de nosotros, que venimos de un pueblo muy pequeño de Puebla. Entonces, este, pues, de, en, bueno, de ese año se fue haciendo cada día más grande. Y, y bueno, estamos hasta donde estamos ahorita y pues esperamos que este carnaval sea mucho más grande, porque es una tradición muy bonita para nosotros, que nos inculcan a nuestros padres y queremos seguirlo llegando a cabo. 
So this carnival was started nine years ago. He said it was basically a family affair, and it's grown every year to get bigger and bigger. Uh, and you know, it's something that's that's passed on from parents to children, and they're you know they're very excited. It's a it's a beautiful tradition, and they're glad to keep it alive and, and share it with uh, with Philly. Y por último, me me dio mucho gusto escuchar lo que nos había dicho este Jesse acerca de invitarnos a su parade de mummers y pues yo estaría muy encantadísimo si llegamos a participar algún día ahí. And lastly, uh, one wants to thank Jesse for the invitation to the Mummers Parade that he's happy to take him up on and, and yeah. hopes you know, one day to be part. <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's give another round of applause to David and Edgar for bringing the costume and uh, the history to us tonight. We are going to have some, uh, some questions and answers before we get the party kicked off for, for the rest of the night. But first, I want to call up Los Bomberos de la Calle, who are going to be doing a, yeah. This is a group uh, here from the neighborhood, I believe, who actually teach, uh, they do some workshops for students here in, in this very uh, building, at Taller. And they're going to be doing a, a brief demonstration of some traditional Puerto Rican uh, rhythms, bomba y plena, and discuss how they relate to the carnival traditions, especially in Ponce, in the southern part of Puerto Rico. my group members. I have uh, Jonathan here. He's one of my lead singers for the Plena. I have Michael, he's one of my percussionists. I have Nico, who does the megaphone singing for the Boca. Uh, Chris, which is one of our lead dancers. And uh, Santiago, which is one of our percussionists. Uh, we also have some dancers that are upstairs getting ready uh, for you guys for a little bit later on tonight. Um, now, a little bit about the Plena. Uh, you hear a lot of plena in some of the carnavals in, in Puerto Rico, especially in Ponce. Um, I know some of you know about the Vejigantes. Uh, we have two different types of Vejigantes. There's one that comes from Luisa in Puerto Rico, um, which is made of a coconut. You can see uh, some of the artwork uh, that Tayel has there. And the one from Ponce is made out of paper mache water, flour, you know, um, it's real, sim real simple to make, but can get really detailed at certain points. Now, to go into the plena, uh, we have panderos, okay? There are three panderos to start the plena rhythm. There's a bajo, there's a bajo, and there's a seguidor and a requinto. Then we have the guido, or which is known in Puerto Rico, the original name is guicharo. A lot of people know it as Guido, they don't know, really know it as uh, Guicharo, but that is the original name for the Guido when we played in Puerto Rico. And then we also use, instead of the Maraca, sometimes we use the Shekere, okay? It's also a gourd with the beads around to give it that sound, okay? Now, this first instrument, what I'm going to do is, I know we don't have too much time, is I'm going to go real brief over some of the uh, percussion of the plena, how it started. We have the bajo, which is the biggest drum, okay, which gives the bass. A little bit louder. Okay, this is the bajo, this is what starts the plan out, okay? Then we have the seguidor that comes in. A little bit more for me. And then the one thing special about the smallest bandero, okay, this is called the requinto or quinto. This drum adds a lot of flavor to the plena with many cuts, okay, different types of solos, various uh, types of sounds. Then we have the Wicha. Okay, and we have the Shake It. In. Now, in Puerto Rico, okay, Back in the day, plena was more so known as an instrument.
metal newspaper, okay? Now, um, they didn't really have a way to spread the news around Puerto Rico. So the way they did it, whether it be in the morning or the afternoon, you would hear the banderos going off in the town, and they would talk about what would happen in the town, whether it be a fire, somebody got married, I just bought a new car, right? No matter what type of news it might be, one of the songs I know is, uh, they have one talking about a fire in the town, which is called Fuego. Fuego, 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 fuego la cantera, llámelo bombero, mama, que pueblo se quema. Okay, and the song goes on and on. Um, but again, Plana, one of the most important things about Plana, which is very is seen in a lot of carnivals in Puerto Rico, is that it spreads the news of what happens in that town because they didn't have a way of, of talking about what went around in that town. So um, that's pretty much it for the Plana. I want to... Um, go into the bomba and I'm going to let uh, Chris Aviles explain a little bit about the bomba where we have some of the percussionists jump on top of the drums and again we're going to show you guys a little performance of some plena and, and bomba a little bit later on tonight. Thank you. As Anthony said, my name is Christopher Aviles. Um, I hope I can get as much of the story out in the little bit of time that we have. Am I talking loud enough on the mic? Yeah. Okay. Um, so bomba is a very different type of music. It's not any, like any type of music um, that you hear on the radio that uh, you might hear out in the street, right? This type of music doesn't, you don't dance to this music. This music gets played to you. So, let me elaborate on that a little bit. There's a basic rhythm. We want to play a little bit of Sika right now, Bomba Sika. What you hear right now is a basic rhythm. Called Bomba Sika, right? So, there's a basic paseo. A paseo is the basic dance, right? This is basically showing off to everybody that you're about to be the one in the spotlight. There's nobody else dancing at the same time that the person that's going to be going to is dancing, right? So, every movement that the dancer does gets replicado on the drum. So if I go something like, you heard that? There was a different tone to the music. Another 
very upbeat music. And then you have Dua. Thank you, everybody. Um, Tropicalismo for having us here and definitely listen to uh, some of the other different cultures, Brazil, Mexico. Um, brought some new light to me. Very interested in this. So I'm going to do a little bit of research on, my, on that myself. But um, again, thank you, everybody, for having us. We are Los Bomberos de la Calle. Gracias. And, and I do hope everybody plans on sticking around tonight because there's going to be an encore performance in the middle of the dance floor once we clear all these chairs out and get the music pumping. So you'll get to see, you get to dance and party with Los Amberos de la Calle right here in this room. Uh, but before we get to that point, I wanted to invite Carmen Vivo San Miguel, the direct, executive director of Taller Puerto Riqueño, to give us some concluding remarks before we bring our panel back for a short Q&A. Government? Hello, everybody. Having fun? Yeah. Well, good evening, and thank you so much for joining us and joining me at Tropicalismo. I just wanted to Number one, you know, welcome you all and thank you for, for your support and for joining us. And of course, uh, you know, if you want to stay connected to Taller, we have a membership forms and registration and give, you know, send your emails and put, up, put, put your name on your mailing list and so on and so forth and stay connected to future events. But we wanted to let you know about a, an upcoming um, invitational show that we are calling Art Pages. It opens on April 17th, and the idea is that the gallery is going to be open to you, to the community, to anybody that has some artistic inclination. So if you can produce a piece um, of any size that fits into a, an 11 by 11 space that can be hung on a wall, your art will be welcomed. And you know the idea is that it's going to be shown anonymously uh, we're going to have to sell them, and whatever sells is going to all sell for $15. So you, your art may be next to, I don't know, um, Marta Sanchez's work, uh, who is, I just saw coming in, <laughs> uh, who is, you know, a, a, a very recognized artist, uh, or um, I don't know, who knows, we may have surprises, uh, you know, from uh, Antonio Martorell or something. So, um, you know, whatever we collect will support Taller's, Taller's uh, programs, but um, you will have an opportunity to show work. <laughs> so, uh, if you're so inclined, talk to Rafael, he can give you the details of when the work, uh, you know, is going to be coming in. We're calling it our pages because if your work fits an eight and a half by eleven page, we will frame it for you. <laughs> so, thank you so much, enjoy, and uh, this is a wonderful program. Thank you, Carmen. And I'd like to invite our panelists back up to the table, please. We're going to uh, take some questions from the audience. We would love to hear uh, what you are curious to learn more about, uh, cross connections between the different groups, the different traditions. We open up the floor to you. Uh, I think the best way to do this is to 
maybe have the mic. One mic uh, can be uh, handed off to the audience members if you wouldn't mind coming a little closer. And then we'll have another mic here on the table for the uh, for the speakers. So does anybody have any questions they want to ask about? If not, I'm gonna I'll jump in. But uh, I want to I want to give the give everybody a chance here. Nobody, not a soul. Somebody, oh, from from Barbaco has a question. What are, what what is the carnival celebrating? Oh, he's asking what what is carnival celebrating? Um, I might I might actually field that one. Uh, so the the very the carnival the word is derived from I think it's it would be Latin for um, carne vale and it's um, carne is meat and vale as in I think as in like permitted or um, uh, prohibited so the you know it, when Lent begins forty days before Easter in the Catholic tradition one refrains from eating meat on Fridays and in general abstains from uh, earthly pleasures. And the um, carnival thus is the last ditch effort to get in all of your vices and your excesses and uh, your meat consumption for that matter uh, before the 40 days of Lent. Uh, it also evolved in, and this is in, you know, traditionally in Catholic Europe and then uh, exported to the Americas, as a kind of social leveling so it was the one day a year, so the, the saying goes, that a king would dress like a pauper, and a pauper would dress like a king. And the, the traditional societal rules, especially in a place like Europe, that was still a medieval or a feudal society with very rigid class distinctions, uh, those would not apply for one day. Uh, and is, uh, uh, scholars and historians have sort of interpreted that as, you know, it was a temporary thing to kind of keep the social order in place the rest of the year. You know, if you let the masses have one day of fun, uh, then maybe they'll be less likely to revolt and uh, overthrow the monarchy uh, the rest of the year. Sometimes that works out, sometimes it didn't. Wow. <laughs> Apparently I'm getting overthrown. Uh, and then, it, and so yeah, that, it was brought in the Catholic uh, tradition to Brazil uh, by the Portuguese, to the Caribbean by uh, French plantation owners. And since it got adopted by many different groups, not necessarily Catholic, so that's why you also see carnival happening many different times of the year. Uh, for example, in the Dutch West Indies, the Dutch Caribbean, which is traditionally Protestant, they actually use the Dutch Queen's birthday as the date on the calendar when they host their carnival. Or as I mentioned before, many of the communities in the US and in, in Europe, uh, because it doesn't make a lot of sense to be prancing around in a skimpy costume in the middle of February or March, have moved it to um, holidays. For example, in New York City, they do it Labor Day weekend. In uh, London, they do it a bank holiday weekend, as they call it. So these three-day weekends are sort of opportunities on the civic calendar rather than the religious one that allow for people to have some time off for, for this kind of leisure. Yeah, Hi, I was going to ask the mummers, um, basically the mummers and the Spanish San Mario parade, y yo te lo traduzco en español. When, I understand like right after January 1st, you guys are already planning the next year. Like when, how do you do the planning and when do the themes come up? And once you join the troop, like how long do you guys prepare? Like you were inviting people to join. So, you know, like I know they can't, you know, join like December, you know, or like how long would it take you to... Uh, Y también, este, cuando ustedes empiezan con la, el carnaval, que es en abril, este, cada año se cambia la tema. ¿Y cuánto tiempo ustedes este, usan a preparar, como lo, si tienen baile o lo que sea? Well, I can say, um, that uh, it's different for every group, I think, that participates. Um, I do. I think uh, we we start to get it together in February, and our process starts basically with a lot of joking around, and then maybe also venting about things that are making us angry, and then making up jokes about those things that are making us angry, and then that to me is the most fun part because all these things happen that actually never end up happening, and they're all happening in our minds, and um, and it, the they're very it's a very fun process to write a mummer skit, but. Um, 
people do it differently, and I think that the, the story you were telling about how people start on January 1st is, is from established groups who do very, very sophisticated things, and that there's a whole uh, level of, uh, different levels of, of uh, how much effort people put in. There's definitely people who brag that they started a week before New Year's, and you know, and they still placed or whatever, so. Um, really, that I think that's a myth that serves to keep people excluded, in a way. Uh, and that that should not stop you from marching this year's group. Eh, en el caso de San Mateo Carnavalero, el carnaval originalmente también es eh, un día antes del viernes de ceniza. En Huejotzingo son dos semanas de carnaval. En Filadelfia es eh, el último domingo de abril. Para, para estar en este carnaval es de este niños, como decía David. Los niños van, van aprendiendo desde que son chiquitos, entonces practicar esto te toma toda la vida. Cuando alguien se integra a, a, ya de, de adulto, obviamente tiene que aprender eh, los movimientos que hace cada personaje. Entonces podríamos decir que es un entrenamiento que, que se nace ¿no? con él. Y, y, si, y, y, a, y en apariencia es un mismo baile, pero cada, cada personaje baila y mueve el cuerpo de forma diferente. So, uh, the carnaval de... Uh, I cannot, yo no puedo pronunciar. But Carnival de Puebla, uh, it traditionally takes place before Ash Wednesday, the, the, the traditional Catholic uh, carnival you know, pre-Lenten season, uh, the Fat Tuesday or Mardi Gras as we know it in, in New Orleans, for example, uh, and actually lasts for two weeks. So the two weeks leading up to Ash Wednesday is, is Carnival in Puebla, and here in, in Philly they do it the last Sunday in April. Es para ser un poco antes de Cinco de Mayo, ¿sí? To be the last Sunday before Cinco de Mayo. Uh, and as far as the other uh, component of the, the question, uh, it's something that you're, you're born with, he said. It's something you're kind of trained from, uh, from really young. It almost, you know, just comes naturally because it's part of the heritage and part of the tradition. Y, y, uh, la pregunta, ¿por qué nosotros hacemos el carnaval o por qué se originó? Eh, después del 5 de mayo, siete años después, este pueblo decide que quiere hacerle un homenaje a, a los soldados de, de, de la guerra de intervención francesa. Y así es como se originó este carnaval. Ah, por eso que en 1860. Okay. So the yeah, the original that wasn't clear from the presentation. Um, the original carnaval de Puebla dating back from I think it was 1879, 1869. Uh, was seven years after the French uh, invasion of Puebla uh, that was repelled by the, the soldiers who are uh, the, the basis of the costumes that you saw in the video and here on stage tonight. And so yes, it began, it began at that time as a, as a way of honoring them. So that's, that's a different um, you know, tradition and a different origin story than we, we you know, are just about to enter Lent, so we're going to have a big party. It's using a historical moment. Uh, you know, which is a, a common kind of uh, approach for different carnival traditions. You know, they, they want to have carnival, maybe they're not Catholic, maybe they, they don't sort of feel that the Catholic rationale makes sense for their particular culture, or their particular situation. So a historical event, for example, can be one way of, um, of creating a carnival tradition, or using it as like a point of, of origin for a story, for characters, for costumes. I think that's a good a good note to conclude on. Um, I also was uh, told to give a little plug for David Pina uh, as the owner of Tamelex at uh, 7th and Federal. I, I had a tip off that it's some of the best uh, Mexican and Honduran food you can find in Philly. So if uh, if you wake up tomorrow with a hangover or just hungry and you need somewhere to get a bite to eat, Tamelex at 7th and Federal should be on your uh, weekend agenda. Um, so and I, I believe these folks actually have to get back to the restaurant and, and uh, you know, make sure the kitchen's in order. So a big thanks once again to all of our panelists. Thank you, Pina, Edgar Ramirez, Jesse Rengon, Alex Shaw. And yeah, this is a totally hand-stitched costume, by the way. It's worth, it's, this is like $2,000 worth of labor and materials. Yeah, and it's made, it's made by hand by the original artisans of this tradition in Puebla and then brought to Philly. 
So definitely put April 26 on your calendar. That's, that's the, the, the most important other business. Um, so just some housekeeping notes as we move into the second phase of our evening. Uh, we are going to, to kick it carnival style, partying for the rest of the night. We hope you stick around with your dancing shoes. We are going to clear these chairs out of the way.